Good morning, it's 9 a.m. in Santiago de Chile, same time in New York City. My name is Karen Poniatik. I am the head of the Global Center at Columbia University here in Santiago. Before introducing our guests, I will turn the screen over to Alberto Salas, the president of Fundación Chilena del Pacifico, our co-host for this morning events. Alberto? Thank you, Karen. Dear friends, I would like to begin this welcome words by expressing my gratitude to the University of Columbia's Global Centers, our partners today to host this webinar, and to all of you for being with us this morning. We are glad to see this tremendous level of participation with professionals from many different industries, backgrounds, and nationalities connected. Just to mention a few, we have invited for Malaysia, Nepal, Russia, United States, Chile, of course, and others. In a significant way, this is actually an excellent example of globalization, possibly thanks to the unparalleled expansion of the technology during the, the 21st century, the key feature of our time. The topic of this morning webinar could not be more real, as it is clear to me that we are, have a lot at stake when it comes to the present and future of what, of what we call globalization. It goes without saying that Chile needs to keep a close eyes on the evolution of what we have historically understood as the globalization process. As a small country highly connected to the world, current and potential trends affecting aspects such as global trade and protectionism, global value chains, investment flows, innovation drivers, world environmental and health dilemmas, and so many others are critical to our growth and ultimately development potential. Our country, as many are, has a lot to win and a lot to lose depending on the path <laughs> forward for globalization. Globalization is also the core of what we strive to encourage at the Pacific at the Chile Pacific Foundation. As a premier public-private institution devoted to the promotion of our country integration into the Asia-Pacific region, we strongly believe in the benefits that globalization has brought to Chile and the world as a whole. This does not mean that there are a myriad of challenges ahead, from geopolitical and social tensions to economic financial and environmental concerns. This is why today's webinar is so significant and to walk it through the fascinating topics. It is a great honor to have such incredible experts today. This said, I give the floor to Karen Poniacic from Chile's Columbia Global Center, who will moderate this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alberto. Uh, I guess our guests do not need much of an introduction. They're extremely well, no well known globally. Just to say that Jeff is currently a professor at Columbia University where he directs the Center for Sustainable Development. Uh, he also directs the Center for Sustainable Development Networks at the UN. Felipe is a professor at Universidad Católica de Chile at Clapes Use and a former Minister of Finance. You both co-authored a book in 1993, Macroeconomics and the Global Economy, that has been translated into 10 languages. Today we'll talk enough about another book which just came out. It's called The Ages of Globalization. It was actually published three weeks ago and it's available, uh, Jeff, I think at Amazon. Uh, both uh, in print and digitally. We're going to be talking about digital a lot. Uh, Jeff, in what is a breathtaking uh, review of the history of world economics from 70,000 years ago, starting with the Paleolithic Age, you talk about seven ages of globalization, ending with the current one, the digital age. For the benefit of those who haven't read the book, Maybe you can start by describing this digital age for us, and then we'll pick it up from there to talk about current events and what's happening with regards to this current age of globalization in times of pandemic. So, Jeff? 
Karen, thank you very much. And Felipe, uh, thanks so much for uh, the opportunity to be together. And uh, thanks to the Chile Pacific uh, Foundation. Uh, we're really I'm so happy with the work of the foundation and the commitment to globalization and to keeping a, an integrated uh, world uh, together. The idea of, of the book, Karen, is that we have been a global species uh, really from the very beginning. By globalization, I mean interconnectedness, that we trade, we move uh, as uh, human beings uh, around the world. Uh, we share ideas, transmit ideas, and that interconnectedness has been with us from the very beginning of uh, the modern uh, human species uh, from the time that uh, uh, our ancestors left the continent of Africa and spread all over the world. And I trace how that interconnectedness has changed over time, mainly driven by technology and ideas and the changes of our governance and institutions. So the first phase, the Paleolithic phase, is when we left uh, Africa and many of our traits uh, of uh, in-group loyalties and cooperation, uh, uh, movement across the planet were first formed. Then comes agriculture, the Neolithic uh, revolution, and uh, we begin uh, as a settled uh, species. Um, and that occurs in the Americas as well as uh, in the old world, uh, as it were, uh, Asia, uh, Europe, and Africa. Uh, the next, uh, actually, the next phase uh, is with the domestication of the horse, which I regard as uh, basically equivalent to the invention of the automobile uh, in uh, the late 19th century, because the horse changed everything for humanity. We could move fast. Uh, we could go to war at long distances. Uh, empires could be formed over uh, hundreds of kilometers for the first time in large governing areas. And so the domestication of the horse was very particular, however, because there were no wild horses left in the Americas, uh, as opposed to the old world. Uh, that was a sad fact that came from the extinction of horses, probably through hunting, with the early arrival of uh, uh, Americans uh, 10,000 uh, to 12,000 years ago. Well, however that happened, uh, the horses were only in the old world and that's where the biggest advances of technology, uh, long distance trade occurred. In the Americas, the only uh, long distance pack animals were in the Andes, of course, the uh, alpacas, the llamas, uh, and that made a huge, huge effect on history. Well, then came the age of the great empires, uh, the Roman Empire, the Han Empire, the uh, various Persian empires, uh, the Mauryan Empire uh, in the Indian subcontinent, uh, and then uh, the next era that I talk about is the era of ocean empires, uh, which emerged when uh, ocean navigation, uh, not that it was discovered because the Chinese really were ocean navigators in the Indian Ocean already in uh, the uh, 1300s and early 1400s, but the Europeans discovered ocean navigation, I wouldn't say perfected it, but advanced it significantly. And with Columbus's uh, voyages of discovery and Vasco da Gama reaching Asia, suddenly there was a world economy. Uh, and this was global capitalism in its uh, first, uh, it, its first uh, variant. And uh, Adam Smith, the father of uh, economics, modern economics, declared that uh, those two voyages by Columbus and da Gama were the two most significant events in the history of humanity because they united the whole world. So that was really globalization uh, in its uh, current sense of truly global scale enterprise. Of course, every time we had a new era, there was conflict, violence, conquest, 
and with the ocean uh, <coughs> voyages, mass industrial scale slavery as well, uh, with the 14 million Africans uh, brought as slaves to the Americas uh, for the new global continent industry, the new global tobacco industry, and so forth. The next major phase is, uh, comes through one invention uh, overwhelmingly, although that led to dozens of pivotal uh, changes and in new inventions, and the most important of which was the steam engine. Uh, the steam engine was probably the single most transformative invention in, uh, in human history since agriculture because suddenly we could harness mass energy and that meant a change of everything, a change of scale of production, the rise of industry, the increase of the uh, number of, the hum of humans uh, on the planet by 10 times from the start of the 19th century till today, roughly from 800 million to 8 billion people increase because of food production and the ability to move food around the planet. Well, everything changed. The country that got there first, where the steam engine was invented, Britain, became the world uh, dominant power. Uh, I would say it was a dominant power built on a navy that was built on steam. Uh, and uh, that gave the British Empire the, uh, r really the, the, the case of being the first global empire ever with reach everywhere in the world. Uh, the sun never setting on the British Empire, uh, so to speak, except the British Empire ended up uh, handing over the baton to the American Empire. Uh, and it was already declared in 1941 uh, by Americans that this was the American century uh, coming up. Uh, and indeed for Many decades, the U.S. ruled the roost. It was the most powerful country, the dominant country. And I'm saying that we're really in a new era right now on many different levels. Uh, first, like all the other great transformations, technology is at the core. We're in a digital world. This morning, together, we're in a digital world. Uh, through this pandemic, we've been in a digital world uh, in our statecraft, in our geopolitics, we're in a digital world. You look at the skirmishes between China and the U.S. in recent weeks. They're about the digital economy, fundamentally. Who's going to control it? Who's going to have uh, the uh, lead in semiconductors? Who's going to control social media? Uh, the U.S. is desperately trying to prolong the American century. Uh, China's trying to uh, have its... Uh, a place in the sun, <laughs> I would say. So this is a part of the new era. It does mean, in my view, and I know we're going to talk about this, that the American century is over. Uh, not that uh, the United States, you know, has disappeared, uh, though I do feel these days it's in a kind of state of collapse. But uh, it is that the U.S. is no longer the dominant country by any means. It's an extraordinarily powerful country. It's actually a dangerous country, I'm sad to say, uh, in many ways. Uh, but it is no longer the dominant country, except in Donald Trump's imagination. So here we are in the new age, uh, and uh, we're trying to make sense of it. And lo and behold, that most global of phenomena hits us, uh, and that is a pandemic. Uh, so this is a disease that within a few weeks spread to the entire world a kind of measure of how interconnected we are. I note in the preface, which I wrote in the last moments, just as the pandemic was hitting, that uh, it's estimated that it took 16 years for the bubonic plague to spread from China to Italy in uh, the 14th century from 1331 to 1347. So 16 years of overland or shipping travel, whereas in this epidemic, it was 16 days, basically, or maybe 16 hours, more accurately, from uh, Wuhan to Rome in a direct uh, flight. This virus uh, traveled by air, uh, and it traveled all over the world instantaneously. It's pummeling our economies. 
Uh, it's pummeling our societies. It's claiming hundreds of thousands of deaths so far. It's a global phenomenon. It's not the end of globalization. It is a case of globalization on the dangerous side. Uh, but fortunately on globalization, the positives are even uh, more powerful than these negatives. That's, are, that's the idea. <laughs> are they? Uh, let's talk about, you, you mentioned that the, every new era comes with violence and conflict. We have several um, current conflicts to discuss in this digital area. Uh, inequality, which you talk about in the book, geopolitical confrontations, which you <coughs> touched on, uh, environmental degradation, plus enter the social and economic uh, consequences crisis due to the pandemia and the pandemia itself. So maybe Jeff, uh, you want to touch on some of those challenges and maybe Felipe can touch on, on some of the others. And then we can go, you've raised several other topics, uh, the end of the unipolar world, uh, China and the US, and we can talk about that later. Questions can be sent uh, to please to the cgc.santiago at Columbia edu um, email address. We'll uh, Karen, just a, just a short uh, a comment on... Uh, Felipe, sure. Yes, a short comment on, on, on one of Jeff's remarks. Uh, when Jeff said that uh, the UK empire was the first truly global empire, the sun never sets, I think Charles V in England is, would be complaining, Jeff, because... Uh, in Spain. It's in Spain in the yeah. 16th century, where the first time, I think Charles V himself said, the sun never sets in my, in my domains. Right. So I just, just for the record, and for, you know, it, just not to get, it, take away from Spain, which by the way, as we discussed many times, saw the industrial revolution was an empire and then saw the industrial revolution go by, you know, because it happened somewhere else. And, and we in Latin America, you know, uh, uh, well, we suffered because the Industrial Revolution, which gives way to your industrial age in, in, in your book, uh, you know, we were a colony of Spain at the time the Industrial Revolution started. So we saw it pass uh, 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 too. And it was mainly in three countries where that Industrial Revolution happened first in the UK, then Germany, then the US. You know, all Protestant countries, according to Max Weber's theory. <laughs> I, I, I think you know, what you say is, uh, is, is very true. Uh, you know, Spain and uh, Portugal, uh, with the help of, uh, of uh, the Borges Pope in, uh, in uh, uh, 1494, divided the world between the two empires. Uh, on, on one side, uh, Spain got its possessions, uh, and on the other side, uh, east of the famous line, uh, uh, Portugal got its possessions, uh, and uh, hence uh, Brazil speaking Portuguese and uh, the rest of South America speaking Spanish. Uh, one could say that was a, uh, a global empire uh, because there were possessions in Asia as well, of course, uh, in the Philippines, uh, in, uh, in the islands, in the Indian Ocean. Uh, it wasn't as deep and prolonged an empire, of course, because the technologies were much weaker. And when Spain was defeated in 1588 in, uh, in the war with the Britain, the Spanish Armada uh, defeat, uh, many historians think that that was really the doom because everything depended on control of the seas. Uh, but it is true that uh, the Industrial Revolution uh, was a Northern European phenomenon. I'm not sure it was a Protestant phenomenon, actually, but it was a Northern European phenomenon. Uh, and uh, a first mover advantage uh, in steam was enough to uh, enable Britain to build a really a remarkable empire. Yeah. And uh, Karen, uh, I think the main point uh, that I would say about all major transformations and all major technological advances is that there are losers as well as winners. Uh, and usually for two reasons. Uh, one is that uh, technology is highly disruptive. So when there's a better way to do something, those who were doing something uh, the old way lose. Uh, 
we have a better technology for producing energy now, photovoltaics, for example, but the oil industry is going to kick and scream to its grave uh, saying, no, 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 we're, we're the ones in charge. So we always see the, the old guard fighting to uh, hold on, even when there's something much better, cleaner, more efficient, safer in place. So that's, that's one part of this. In the labor markets, there are almost always losers uh, as well as winners when technologies come. Uh, of course, we remember famously uh, the case of the weavers in England trying to smash the machines. They became called the Luddites uh, because uh, 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 that was the place where this uh, occurred, but uh, we remember them as against progress. But they weren't against progress, they were against their own poverty and unemployment because they were, they were hand weavers uh, and suddenly the machines were putting them out of business. What do we have today in the digital age? We have a, a, a huge transformation underway where brick and mortar shops, brick and mortar campuses of universities, brick and mortar banks, uh, everyone is finding, oh my God, there's a different way to do this online. Uh, in New York now, even though the epidemic has come way, way down, thank goodness, people are not going back to the office because they don't want to. <laughs> not because uh, they can't, but because they don't want to. Why commute an hour and a half each day? So people who own real estate are finding that they're uh, their possessions are not worth as much, but also people are being left unemployed. Uh, office support workers, uh, people in retail shops. Uh, I just had a knock on uh, my door because we had a direct delivery of our groceries just now. Uh, this is uh, basically soaring everywhere uh, in the world, uh, but many people are being left farther and farther behind. Uh, we've gone digital so hard and so fast in the last six months in the US that Mr. Bezos, the founder and owner of Amazon, has had a personal increase of his bank account of $75 billion since January 1. Uh, you know, the whole economy has shifted to Amazon uh, for everything, uh, or to Walmart, or to a few others, they're getting phenomenally rich, where many people are getting poorer and poorer because they're out of work. Uh, we've had a loss of employment of more than 10 million people. I don't think many of those jobs are coming back anytime soon. So this is part of change. And then one other point is the geopolitics. You know, Boy, we're watching uh, the, the gloves come off. It's a pretty bare-fisted uh, battle right now, partly because Trump is a, he's, he's a nasty guy. So he's like a barroom brawler to begin with. Uh, somebody once told me, a, a so-called friend of his told me, this is the guy who will smash the chair across your back in a barroom fight. Uh, and Trump's a kind of thug. Uh, so he's taken off the gloves and it's the fight over who controls the digital technologies now. So a Chinese company, Huawei, got ahead of the US companies 5G in 5G. It's just a better company. It's not that they spy on us more. By the way, the one that spies on me the most is the US government. No question, no doubt. So uh, maybe with Huawei, it's harder for them to spy on, on, on me. Uh, but my, you know, the surveillance I know is the US government spying on me. I don't know if anyone else does, but the US government definitely does. So the real issue is they got ahead. What Huawei did was package 5G technology, superbly low cost, easy to install, and so on. And that freaked out the American policymakers. We don't have any 5G producers like that, so we're years behind. So Trump announced, okay, you can't buy any US semiconductors anymore. Well, that, that wasn't good enough because other countries make the semiconductors. Then Trump said last week, 
you can't buy any semiconductors from any company that uses any U.S. technology. Okay, this is a kind of game, but a quite serious one right now. This is not about markets, fair competition, open trade. This is about who is the top of the heap. So this is kind of alpha male stuff. Uh, and uh, it, it's pretty dangerous, actually, but it's also part of a new technology. And the truth is, well, you know, when Britain came first to the steam engine, it went and beat up the whole rest of the world. So <laughs> this is control over technology and history has also been the real source of power. Let me Before think. going into the China-US um, conflict, I'll, I'll, I'll take a question from Axel Christensen from BlackRock. Felipe, many economists are calling for a sustainable recovering to the recovery to the COVID crisis at a time and we're seeing extremely, probably the highest unemployment uh, rates in a very long time. Can both, can recovery be both sustainable and also generates the new jobs, the amount of new jobs we need? Well, that's a very, <clears throat> that's a very important question, Karen. Uh, let me just uh, say a, a short remark on one of Jeff's points. Jeff says that the U.S. government is probably spying on him. I would say, Jeff, they don't need to spy on you. You speak so <laughs> openly. <laughs> I mean, it's not that they're thrilled to what you're saying, you know, but, <laughs> but they're, they don't need to spy. I mean, on top of that, they may be spying. Uh, anyway, uh, the, let, me, let me go into your question, Karen. The <coughs> issue that we're now seeing is for many countries, this is the worst uh, uh, depression. This is more, it's more like a depression than a recession since the 1930s. So we're talking about something that happened, uh, uh, you know, all, almost a century ago. Question is how the recovery would like, look like. And we are going to see probably a Jeff briefly touched on this issue, we're going to probably see output recovering before employment recovers. Employment recovery will be more prolonged because many companies have been going out of business in, during this period. And we actually know of the large companies who are filing in the U.S. for Chapter 11 and our companies here filing for uh, uh, protection against creditors. But those are only the big cases. We are not seeing the small shops, the restaurants, the groceries, and all those who are closing for good. Many companies are saying, we are, unfortunately, we cannot resist this any longer, so we're closing for good. So what we will see is that, yes, there will be an initial phase of the recovery that will look like a V, but it will be like a very short V, because then you will see something, you know, that goes, uh, it, it will be, a long time before we reach the employment levels that were lost. And it's not only that, but it will be more precarious jobs because probably formal jobs will be harder to regain. And a lot of people will go and go to the streets and try to work on informal jobs, uh, street vendors and, 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 and other types of jobs like that. Is there a space for sustainable development, for a sustainable, absolutely. And absolutely, I will say, two things here. Uh, it, one is mitigation, the other is adaptation. There are a lot of investments. This will be a recovery where we need a lot of investment. And the investment will come, we need to make sure that the private sector has the right incentives so that they can participate on this. But it will be a lot of also public investment. Investment in, in power plants, investment in new energy, you know, this is part of what will drive the, uh, uh, the economy back. So I think there is a lot of reinforcement between the sustainable part and the growth part. These are not two separate camps where they're fighting against each other, but it's basically, you know, they're moving, they could be moving together. Let me give you another example on adaptation. Small, there are projects, you know, there was, are being adaptation bonds, one of them, uh, was raised uh, and, and issued for Africa. And for small farmers, you know, small farmers get water, get some uh, technology for small farmers. That is hugely job creating. You know, small farmers, the 
uh, agriculture in many countries, particularly in the most vulnerable countries, as industrial countries have left agriculture, you know, to a very, uh, agriculture is probably now 1% of the labor force. In many of the vulnerable countries, agriculture is very important. So there is opportunity for clean agriculture where you have this new uh, technologies and you have the access to water. Water is now one of the big issues in the world economy, how to get safe uh, access to water. So yes, absolutely, there is space for uh, sustainable recovery, but it will take time. We have to be patient in the meantime. We need to have programs for the people, for the vulnerable people, for the poor people. You know, we need to have also, we cannot forget the middle classes, you know, and, and this is what is creating a huge pressure on public, on public budgets. So one of the, we will have unemployment, you know, getting back to the <clears throat> old levels, it will take time, not to mention that the U.S. was below three and a half percent unemployment when all of this started. You know, now it's over, it's over 10 percent and it's probably over. And in many countries, unemployment will be over 20 percent. So this is the kind of issue that we are dealing with. And I would agree and hope we have, I don't want to sort of give such a long answer, so maybe we'll have time to see where are the issues that will favor globalization and the threats to globalization coming from the pandemic. So let me stop there. I can't miss this opportunity since you've been spied, uh, Jeff. So go ahead and shoot. We're 77 days uh, away from the US elections. We all know who you're gonna vote for, but you did support <laughs> Bernie Sanders uh, in the primary. Why was that? And feel free to bash anybody you want. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Well, you know, I think we're, we're facing uh, the most significant election uh, in our history. Actually, Bernie said that last night uh, in the online Imagine. virtual Democratic uh, convention, and I think he's right. You know, th there are a few reasons for this, but at an individual level, Trump is, uh, is really a mentally unstable person. Uh, so I regard him as quite dangerous uh, and cannot uh, uh, wait to see him uh, out, of, out of office. And as uh, everybody knows, because he says it uh, at full volume, he's going to do everything, including stopping postal services uh, so that uh, mail ballots uh, uh, can't be counted to try to hold on to power. He's uh, just a deeply, uh, profoundly unprincipled a person who does not abide by rules uh, and uh, doesn't abide by science, doesn't abide by information. Uh, and that's why we in the United States have 173,000 COVID deaths uh, right now. And uh, it's the epidemic is still out of control. Trump couldn't even figure out uh, to say much less use a face mask for months into this as uh, thousands were dying every week in the United States. It's just absolutely been, been terrible. But Trump also reflects uh, in our politics a very dangerous uh, part of American politics, and that is really a white us versus them politics. A, a lot of what's happening is the uh, backlash of uh, white working class Protestant Americans uh, against the social rise of others. Uh, America's become less white uh, because of uh, a, or less, uh, we call it uh, white non-Hispanic, uh, awful category, but uh, there's been a lot of uh, migration. Uh, there has been uh, of Asian Americans, uh, of uh, Hispanic uh, Americans. Uh, we have uh, African American population and Trump's base. If you look at any rally, it's all white uh, and it's just awful, but it is really uh, a society uh, at each other's uh, necks right now. Uh, and after uh, the police brutality earlier this spring, the tensions rose further. 
And so that's partly what this election is about as well. Uh, but basically, uh, it's the reason I supported Bernie Sanders is that it's been decades now where American society has become less and less fair and more and more unequal. And I think we all know uh, Chile, the United States, Brazil, countries that are really unequal in income distribution face instability. Uh, and this, I think, is a basic fact. I've always admired the social democracies of Northern Europe as essentially being uh, the best balance of market economy, uh, democracy, personal freedom, and inclusion where everybody gets health care, education, uh, vacation time, leisure time, uh, retirement security, uh, safe upbringing, and so forth, uh, as a matter of just being a citizen in the country. So that's the kind of a social system that I believe in, social democracy. It's, it's the good middle way balance between extremes. And I think that that is a very attractive way. And since I look at data on happiness uh, as editor of the World Happiness Report or co-editor each year, the Scandinavian countries are all or the Nordic countries, I should say, because it includes Finland and Iceland, are all at the top of the list. Uh, Finland, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, they're the happiest countries. They're the most equal countries. Uh, they're highly prosperous. They're very competitive market economies, private ownership, but with a big social sector to ensure that education is high quality for everybody, that healthcare is high quality for everybody, and everybody gets a great six-week summer vacation uh, in uh, in, in the Baltic Sea uh, on, you know, on their sailboats and so on. So it's a really high quality life. Well, all of that is basically what Bernie Sanders was saying, which is, look, we're rich, but we're so unequal that, you know, what the, the Census Bureau in the United States released a report this week that one in five U.S. households reported that they did not have enough to eat last week. They couldn't meet their basic food needs in the United States of America. I know it. I live in New York. I see so many homeless people, so many people in need. And now it's one in, one in five households with children, I should be uh, more precise. It's 12% of households overall, but of those with children, one in five households with children did not have enough food. We're going hungry in the United States of America. And that's because we became an incredibly selfish country. Uh, tax cuts, tax cuts, tax cuts. Uh, so all very self-serving. We've got these gazillionaires like Bezos, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Mark Zuckerberg. How many tens of billions of dollars do you need before you know you say we don't want our taxes cut anymore I mean, where is the most basic decency and so we lost that decency trump is the most indecent of uh, the leaders we've ever had on every scale and all he chortles about still to this day because he's such an idiot by the way but all he talks about is the high stock market price well that's for a tiny part of America. What about the tens of millions of people without health care, the people dying? He doesn't even recognize them right now. So that's why we've got to get rid of him. If we don't, the world's going to be very, very dangerous after November, by the way, because he's got no self-control. And with China, with our democracy where he puts troops into our cities against the wishes of the governors and mayors. I think we'll go to emergency rule in this country if Trump is reelected. I, I think it's that bad. That bad. I do think well, it's that bad. Before going on uh, more on that, uh, Felipe, uh, Jeff has talked about extreme inequality. We're facing extreme inequality here in Chile. Uh, with more than 2 million jobs lost. Now we're also facing hunger. Uh, Jeff says he stands in a middle way between a state central planning system, which doesn't work, and unregulated capitalism. Uh, and he defined 
as North uh, European countries being in the middle way. Where do you see yourself in this continuum between unregulated capitalism and state central planning? How can you best regulate capitalism to avoid its problems, including this one, extreme inequality, and the other ones, uh, environmental degradation, lack of meritocracy, many of those who, which we see in Chile. And the self-regulation work, I would, I would add to that one. And then, Jeff, we're going to come back to what uh, many, I am getting a lot of questions about China. So we're going to go back to China, definitely. Fantastic. Uh, sure, uh, Karen. Well, first, uh, I do not know of any unregulated capitalism today, fully unregulated capitalism. All capitalisms need some form, some form of regulation. I also don't know of any state central planning, which is, you know, uh, the last one was probably Albania, you know, but even Albania has changed. So we are in somewhere in between this, it's like, you know, uh, uh, the extremes, it's between zero and one, but, uh, you know, uh, zero and one do not really exist. So if you say, where would I be? Certainly I would be on a regulated capitalism. A, a regulated capitalism that is important because uh, we need to have regulations so that the markets work appropriately, work adequately. For example, uh, we need to have strong action on top of everything the state does, you know, in terms of spending, in terms of directing resources to the less well off, you know, which is a very important part. There is the uh, institutions and the regulations against monopolies, against collusion, and other types of abuses of the market. So certainly those are parts of the regulations that we need to have. Uh, and we often talk about monopolies. And one of the best policies against monopoly is to open your economy to trade, open trade, fair, open. Uh, and I would say, you know, Chile is an example of openness to trade. Of course, that would Im impose competition on companies that compete against international companies. But the, you still have the issue of regulating service sectors which are not subject to competition, particularly sectors which do not face which have a lot of, uh, uh, I would say, uh, economies of scale. So, you know, in the end, that produces uh, one provider, you know, for a big area in electricity, in water and sewage, and so on. And those need appropriate regulation. So the question is whether we have an economy and we have the institutions that work properly, and probably we can do better there. But you know, I would certainly be on the, on the side of a regulated capitalism. A regulation that on the other hand, we also say, well, we need to regulate, but we know, don't need to suffocate the private sector. We need to have the appropriate regulations, but have the, the environment in which the private sector, and I'm not talking about uh, only about large companies, I'm talking about small and a small and medium-sized business that they can thrive, that they can, you know, make their contribution in this huge uh, problem that we are in. For example, in terms of what we are coming out of this, and you were mentioning, Karen uh, and Jeff mentioned inequality. We're going to come out of this pandemic more unequal than we went mm -hmm. into the pandemic. And in the case of Chile, we have a relatively high level of inequality, but inequality was coming down. If you look at least the Gini coefficients, you know, which is for all their shortcomings, it's our, you know, best measure of income inequality, you know, income inequality was coming down, but probably we're still high. So one thing is the level, the other thing is the trend. Were we making progress on inequality? We were making progress on inequality, probably not at the rate that we wanted. And I would also mention when Jeff said about the uh, uh, discussed the World Happiness Index, you know, and he said, mentioned the Nordic countries, and he said, yes, it, it, there is one uh, a small fact, and, I, and, and Jeff is, of course, proposing this for the United States, but, you know, you have $90,000 per capita, you know, as you have in some of these countries, you know, in, in the Nordic countries, you can do many things that you cannot do when you are at 15000 or $18,000 per capita. So, to have 
a welfare state in a country that has not reached development is a much tougher issue. I would just raise this because, of course, Jeff is saying, well, the U.S. has $60,000 per capita. You know, probably not what Norway has, but Norway has, Norway has, I don't know, five, six million people. And the U.S. have 300 million people. Um, what Jeff is saying, let's move a little bit to take care of those who are less well off, you know, and I would, on principle, be completely in agreement with Jeff. Question is how, you know, and, and how applicable is that uh, uh, with respect to, uh, to, our, uh, to our economies here, for example, in Latin America. And just one final issue, the threats of the pandemic, we will come out from the pandemic poorer. There will be some issues one of them is, of course, some technology improvements that we have discovered in the pandemic. Uh, some industries will lose, but a lot of companies and, you know, government institutions and so on have discovered that they don't need to travel, you know, to make meetings like we have right now. We have, you know, we had registered 1,300 people participating in this meeting that we have here with you, uh, and we can do it through technology. But there are some issues like you know, will we have an increase in protectionism after this? We will come out more unequal with trends to protectionism. This can also touch on migration. Migration, you know, if you have very high unemployment uh, rates, well, then migration uh, it will be probably in, in, in jeopardy. Like the U.S. stopped this, some visa programs, Jeff, very recently, you know, and saying, well, we have the pandemic, we have high unemployment here, we're going to stop some visa programs. So we have a threat to globalization also on, on that. And we have another issue that we br only briefly touch, which is reshoring, the reshoring of companies. That is a, a deglobalization phenomenon in which companies say, okay, multinationals, I need to have my inputs closer to home. And, uh, and some governments, like the government of all of Japan gave tax breaks, tax incentives for companies, manufacturing companies relocating from China to Japan. So, you know, and the US has given also incentives for companies to relocate. So this is, I think, an issue that we will need to see how we cope with the different threats to globalization and globalization for all its, you know, shortcomings has provided a lot of benefits to the world economy among them taking hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. And, you know, a, a lot of them are in Asia and a lot of them are in China. Thank you, Felipe. I won't agree with you on the fact that uh, Chile was doing well in terms of inequality. That's not why people, millions of people came out to the street in uh, last October, unhappy not only because of income inequality, but other types of inequality. But we can talk about that later, the fact sorry, sorry, that they just, didn't feel sorry, treated just, well and uh, lack of meritocracy, et cetera. But let me go to Jeff on this. And uh, yeah, for the record, we really have a lot of questions on China. Jeff, it, sorry, you praised but... China's amazing job of economic development. The phrase you used in one of your interviews was success story of policy. What about governance issues, democracy, of course, human rights, uh, the Hong Kong crackdown, et cetera. Uh, one question from Rodolfo Krause, president of CAP Corporation. Do you think there will be a dramatic change in the relationship between U.S. and China if Biden gets elected in November? Felipe, do you want to just make one quick remark and then I'll come back to you? Yeah, I, I will make He'll, one. We're going to get into, uh, you know. Yeah. Just, sorry, Karen, but uh, just to set it straight, what I said is no, we're not doing, we were not doing well in, in inequality. I said the level of inequality was high. Uh, but it was coming down based on all Gini coefficient. That's a fact. That's not an opinion, Karen. Thank you. We'll talk about, maybe we can ask later to Jeff okay. if he was surprised by the uh, demonstrations in Chile that erupted last, uh, last October. But let's start with China. You know, I think uh, China, um, first of all, has had a, a remarkable economic success over the last 40 years and done it through very hard work and through a, a very effective set of policies. It has lifted hundreds of millions of people from poverty. Also, I've been going to China now for 40 years. China is a far freer place than it was uh, 40 years ago. 
uh, and uh, the quality of life and the well-being of the Chinese population has increased significantly. Uh, China has a different political system from us. That's not 40 years old. That's not 70 years old. That's not with the uh, uh, that that's not with the the emergence of uh, the People's Republic of China. Uh, but it is uh, 2,000 years old because China became a centralized administrative state uh, in 221 BC. Uh, this is a deep tradition of uh, Chinese governance uh, that goes back 2,000 years. Uh, it has been a remarkable success story viewed on a two millennium canvas because uh, it was not engaged in the unending wars uh, that uh, Europe found itself in for century after century after century. Also, China has not been in a single overseas war that it caused in the last 40 years. And the last was a brief uh, war uh, in 1978 with Vietnam. The United States has been in nonstop war, largely wars the U.S. has caused led uh, that has destroyed so many countries uh, from Vietnam uh, in the 1960s and 70s, Laos, Cambodia, uh, the uh, Central American wars, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, twice, uh, Syria, Libya. So I just don't see this comparison that in the U.S., oh, China's so evil and the U.S. is so great. Uh, I just think that we should be dealing with each other on a mature, rational, fact basis. I also don't like the fact that China's accused every day now of, uh, oh, it's so militaristic. Huh? Are you kidding? The United States has 800 overseas military bases. China has one. So we need some measure to be able to see things through the eyes of the other side. I, I quoted uh, Jesus Christ uh, because I like, uh, I say, Jesus Christ's foreign policy. Why do you note the speck in the other person's eye uh, and uh, not the beam in your own eye? So I think that this is uh, actually good foreign policy advice. If we want to have a mature relationship with China, Stop Pompeo, who is a, just an extremist, going around the world telling other countries, don't deal with China. First, fix your own country, my country. Fix it first before you start telling other countries how to act. Stop making so many wars. Stop all these military bases abroad. Stop the arms race. Okay, that would be a good start. And then deal with your counterpart on a mature basis. The United States is uh, 200, uh, uh, what is it, 230 years old. China is uh, more than 2,000 years old. It's a great civilization. It deserves respect, uh, and it should be dealt with on a uh, highly professional uh, and serious level. Uh, and that is uh, my view, not this uh, extremist fundamentalist uh, preacher secretary of state of ours who wants to make crusades uh, and tells countries uh, not to do business with China. That's just ridiculous. Now, what will happen with Biden? No doubt uh, things will be safer and smoother. There won't be irrationality. Uh, Pompeo would be gone, thanks God. Uh, Trump would be gone, thanks God. Uh, but there would still be a lot of competition. There would be challenges about human rights. Uh, the U.S. would say this. China would say, yeah, how about all your, uh, your overseas wars? How about all your poverty? How about all your discrimination? How about all your people in jail? Uh, you know, th there would be answers on both sides, but maybe there would actually be some sane discussion also about how to work together for a good recovery to stop the pandemic, to solve the climate change problems. These are things where we ought to be working together and certainly not just yelling at each other. So you see cooperation 
even though it probably the confrontations will persist. It, this is a question by Jorge Saad at the Center for International Studies at Universidad Católica. So even though um, Trump doesn't win the elections, conflict will continue and you see it would be addressed through cooperation, more cooperation? Yeah, you know, even in the, uh, in the Republican side, especially uh, around the evangelical uh, Christian base, which is Pompeo, uh, everything's a crusade. You know, America is the God-given country and uh, every other country is evil. Uh, and so this is uh, just a kind of uh, religious fundamentalism in part of Trump's base. But then there is, uh, in the Democratic Party side, I, I'd say no love for China in general. I'm uh, definitely more on the uh, Sinophilic end of the spectrum. Of course, I go to China many times a year. Uh, I have so many Chinese students over the last 40 years who have gone to become senior officials. I know they were nice kids. Now they're nice, very senior uh, officials. They're not out to take over the world. They're trying to manage a complicated country and society. So I see things differently from a lot of the Democrats, but I do believe the Democrats are not crazy. I think they're much more rational. I think Trump's crazy, uh, basically, and surrounded by crazy people. So I'm much more worried uh, about that. With the Democrats, I think there will be you know, ongoing competition. I don't think warm relations suddenly, but I don't think big trade wars uh, or uh, breaking all the rules or uh, just trying to stomp out Chinese companies or arresting Chinese uh, senior executives, uh, which is a really, really dumb policy. Uh, and dumb of Canada to play along with it as well. So uh, in, in my opinion, uh, we'll have a much more rational uh, time of uh, interaction, not super friendly, but not uh, leading to conflict. What about the crackdown in uh, Hong Kong? You know, even with Hong Kong, there's a, another story that is so basic that I wish the news would just report it, which is that under uh, Hong Kong's basic law, Article 23, mm -hmm. Hong Kong was supposed to have, supposed to pass legislation on security. And it was a promise made uh, by Hong Kong and as part of an agreement reached with the UK and China 30 years ago. Well, several Hong Kong administrations tried to do it and never got it through the Hong Kong legislature. So Hong Kong was not in, not in conformity with its most basic law and with this Article 23, which says that uh, Hong Kong does not support independence and does not support siding with outside powers for independence, a basic anti-sedition law. It's part of the agreement with the United Kingdom. Hong Kong did not abide by Article 23. There's a context to what's happening. And simply pointing fingers, by the way, with the United States, as usual, stoking up a lot of this and giving hope to people, oh, you know, protest for your independence and so forth, it's very dangerous and very provocative, or what we're doing with Taiwan right now. It's stupid. Our idea is not to have a conflict with China. Our idea should be global cooperation with a very powerful and important country in the world. And to behave ourselves and not to provoke crisis in the other country. And so this is just the most basic statecraft. It's called prudence. And we don't exercise prudence. So it's not about scoring points. It's actually about living together peacefully in a nuclear world, beset by pandemics, climate change, and other things. We need to solve problems in a normal way, not drive things to extremes. And that's even about Hong Kong. Let's discuss but let's understand the context of this as well. 
But the United States, by the way, all over the place, through the CIA and others, creates instabilities, creates local pressures, creates insurrections. I'm not talking about Hong Kong here. I'm talking about generally. And that's part of U.S. statecraft. That's the hidden empire part of U.S. statecraft. It's very dangerous. And so this is part of our irresponsibility that needs to end. And it's, you know, now the reason we're in such a dangerous situation is the U.S. foreign policy is based on the idea of U.S. primacy, that the U.S. is the sole superpower. That is an un impossible standard in our world today. The only way it could be true is by stopping the progress of other countries because the U.S. is only 4.2% of the world population. And that's exactly what we're trying to do with China right now. Stop them from buying technology or chips. That's how a market economy works. You buy companies, you buy chips and so forth. Now suddenly, no, that's not how a market economy works. Well, if we suppress a normal market activity, we will find ourselves in a real confrontation. And that's what we're heading towards. And Trump would, I think, probably bring this to the point of conflict. And conflict in a nuclear age is beyond reason. So for one unipolar world, are we going to a bipolar world or you're looking into a multipolar world? Who else yeah. would be a key actor there? Definitely a multipolar world, because uh, at a minimum, there are three major technological areas of the world, East Asia, uh, Europe, and the United States. I wish that South America were more technologically innovative, but it's not right now. It does not play a role in technological innovation in almost any of the lead sectors, but it should. And India should by all rights, become part of this in Africa in 20 or 30 years. So I'm looking at a world of regions. Uh, China, by the way, is going to get old fast. Uh, the median age in China will rise to more than 50 years old. I have a kind of theorem that uh, people over 50 don't want to take over the world. They just want a quiet life. Uh, so uh, I actually believe that with China's population falling sharply, in the second half of the 21st century from 1.4 billion down to something like a billion with an aging population, China's gonna have a lot to deal with with the quality of life at home. It's in no position to take over the world uh, at all. It's not even, it's never been its intention for 2000 years. It wants respect, that's a different matter. Uh, it doesn't wanna be threatened. It doesn't wanna be divided as it was between 1839 and 1949 with many invasions by Britain, by France, by the United States actions, by Japan. It doesn't want that, it wants security, but it doesn't want to take over the world. So no, China's not, it's not a two region world. It should be a multi-region world. It would really be nice to, if South America could get together. Unfortunately, Bolsonaro is just about as crazy as, uh, as Trump, maybe even crazier. Uh, less dangerous, but crazier. Uh, and we don't have the makings of uh, South American cooperation yet, but it would be a good idea. Uh, and I think it would help South America's recovery from this crisis also to work together on clean energy, on 5G technology, on the digital economy. That kind of regional cooperation could make a very big difference. Do you see, Felipe, that kind of cooperation anytime soon in, in South America and Latin America? Well, I certainly see, a, a, as Jeff said, a multipolar world in which uh, the U.S. will not be the sole player. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, although we will retain a very leading role, it will have to share the, the scenario of the world economy and, and the world with other uh, important players. China, certainly India. There are countries like Indonesia, you know, which are uh, very uh, heavily populated, growing fast. And so Asia will be a powerhouse. What is, what is the role of Latin America here? And I, I see a role for Latin America, but probably uh, 
Latin America is, uh, uh, is widely diverse. For example, it's very different if you look at Mexico than if you look at Brazil. These are the largest economies of our region. But Brazil, for example, is highly dependent on China <laughs> to trade, as Chile is. Chile is uh, by far our most important trading partner with over a third of the total exports is China. Brazil, Peru, and if you look south, all we, we are highly dependent on China through the export mainly right now of commodities. A, a diversified, in some cases, a diversified basket of commodities, but, but, but it's mainly natural resource based. If you look at Mexico, Mexico is different. Mexico does not export commodity, uh, commodities to China. It rather exports to the US. It competes with China in the US. And the Caribbean is a different story. It's mainly services, it's tourism, you know, and, and exports of, uh, you know, also raw materials, but looks, more, so I would say from Central America and the Caribbean North, they look more North and we look more to the East, you know, uh, uh, or depending on, you know, where you are, but, you know, we look more to Asia. We're much more Asian dependent over here. So I hope that we will come out of this pandemic. Uh, we will certainly have a tough time. Latin America, if you look at the IMF, projections, Latin America and Europe were the regions that would be hardest hit by the pandemic in 2020. Question is, how will we recover? There is certainly a role for local policy, but there is also a role for the policies of multinational, uh, international institutions uh, the, that are, you know, helping the countries in the design of policies in, the, in, the, in some particular cases, also in the financing we will need financial resources to move away from this pandemic. Already countries are making a huge effort. You know, this is the most unprecedented effort in terms of fiscal policy in a long time. So how do we deal? Well, well this is part of what we are working together with Jeff in the, La in the Lancet Commission. You know, how, will we, how can we help in the pandemic through a global, regional and local view? So uh, I think we have a lot of challenges. We have opportunities, but it's not clear that South America can be, you know, a powerhouse in this global. We will have to do a lot to get there. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. Can you spare a few more minutes, Jeff, for you have another commitment? I, I, maybe five more minutes. Yeah. Okay, I have a question for you about the digital oligopoly, which uh, you talked about uh, from George Zebulguignan. He's the president of our Columbia Business Alumni Association. You mentioned that the digital era has created a powerful handful of companies with huge potential to continue innovating and creating value for society. And their capability to do so is directly related to their scale and capacity to gather data. However, the same valuable tool also poses a challenge to democracy, freedom of speech, and privacy. So how can we regulate these negative effects without hindering or destroying uh, valuable companies? It's a very uh, big question, and I don't have a clear answer in my own uh, head about what to do with the digital uh, right now, um, even though it's so central. Uh, on the one hand, we have uh, giants, uh, like you say, uh, Amazon, Apple, Google, Microsoft, and so forth, whose uh, market caps are astounding, uh, and they continue to soar. Uh, that's one issue. Uh, a second issue uh, that I think has been put uh, fairly clearly in view, it was a hidden issue, but the control over advanced uh, semiconductors is a big part of the story. Whether that's a chokehold or not is uh, unknown, but right now only a very small number of companies produce the advanced chips that are at the cutting edge of technology. Uh, and uh, the US is uh, trying to stop China from acquiring those advanced chips. Uh, there are differences of opinion uh, in, uh, among experts and in the uh, press about whether China will catch up shortly or not catch up shortly. But this is a chokehold for the moment. Europe is not a player in this. Uh, so it's uh, basically the U.S. 
uh, China and a few manufacturers in Taiwan and Korea and Japan uh, and how they fit into uh, the puzzle is a big issue. A third issue I would raise uh, that's, again, we don't even know the facts, but uh, there is obviously a rapid militarization of these technologies taking place. Uh, the big tech companies in the United States are on major Pentagon budgets right now. Uh, there's a, a lot of secret surveillance. Uh, the US uh, is, our democracy is the weakest it's been uh, perhaps uh, since the Civil War. There's so much surveillance. You remember uh, Ed Snowden's revelations. Oh, they were just put aside. You know, they're not talked about anymore, but they're very real uh, about uh, how industry and the U.S. government and, our, and secret courts subvert uh, our privacy. We don't even know the facts. And Congress uh, doesn't get the facts or aim to get the facts. So we don't even know what the companies do, and we don't really know the militarization, except we see that, say, Elon Musk says, okay, I want to uh, now be the space agency for the Pentagon, uh, or uh, Amazon wants to uh, host, uh, or Microsoft compete to host the cloud activities of the Pentagon. This is horrible, in my view. Uh, not only is the Pentagon too large, too powerful, too dangerous, but Moreover, let it make its own IT, not to uh, militarize every one of American companies. So I don't think we can feel very comfortable right now uh, with the situation of big tech from an economic point of view, an economic power point of view, a, a militarization point of view, uh, a privacy point of view, a human rights point of view, nothing is in place. And in the United States, nothing is really discussed in our politics because these companies are too rich, too powerful, too big campaign con contributors, uh, too much enmeshed in secret US security operations. It's a mess. And uh, unfortunately, Europe is not a player in this uh, almost at all, which is a shame for Europe. And South America, you don't even notice, a, you know, there's no role at all in South America for any of this. There's not one company uh, that is a significant player in this space, which is a huge mistake for the region, by the way. Uh, it's part of the legacy of uh, not having adequate technology policy in general in South America, uh, but South America is not a player in the digital world. Uh, so it's completely 100% vulnerable to uh, the US or to China or to the battle between the two right now. And it's, I would not settle for this at all, but no country in South America is at a scale, even Brazil is so terribly governed right now, but uh, no single country is at a scale to actually be able to address this issue in a coherent way, but I don't see any country actually trying to uh, address it right now in a strategic way. I do have faith in the employees, like in the case of Google, when they went out against the leadership, when Google was trying to sell inter artificial intelligence uh, technology to the Pentagon, I think, same with Salesforce employees. So we still have faith in the employees of these companies coming against the leadership in these aspects. Unfortunately, we ran out of time. We have so many questions, Felipe, about the IDB elections, uh, Jeff, about the recovery, the V-shape, not, re not the V-shape recovery in the U.S., about, uh, well, you know, we've received several questions. I'm sorry we haven't been able to address them all. Maybe a last word, Felipe, on the IDB elections, and then we close. Uh, U.S., uh, uh, maybe, Jeff, you want to chip in. The U.S. proposed this Mauricio Claver Sarmiento to be the president of the U.S. He's a hardliner close to Trump. Uh, uh, many countries, including ours, is are trying to... Uh, 
uh, postpone the elections for after uh, hopefully uh, Biden is elected. Uh, many countries are supporting uh, uh, this Claver Sarmiento, others are don't. don't. Uh, Felipe, where do you stand here? Jeff, where do you stand here? Although I guess you, what, what we will, but you would both answer, but it's good to hear that before closing it. Sure, Karen. Uh, well, first of all, uh, th this is this has not had to do particularly with the U.S. candidate, Mauricio Claver, Carone, but uh, it has to do with uh, the candidate, uh, with the process itself and the institution. There is a rule here, an unwritten rule, but it's a commitment by President Eisenhower back in 1958 that the candidate will be to preside the IDB would be a Latin America. So far for the last, uh, let's say, 60 years, the IDB has been uh, presided by Latin America. And this is the first time in history that the U.S. has proposed a candidate. This has created division. This has created that several countries and I would say dozens of former ex-press, former presidents, former uh, uh, chancellors, former finance ministers have come out with letters calling for postponement of the election to give us time to talk about the agenda the agenda for the IDB for the, after the pandemic, this is a really a, a very unprecedented and, and a special time, and it calls for special measures. And some people say, well, you know, this will, we're ca calling for only a few months of postponement till we have the time to discuss what needs to be done to get Latin America out of this situation. What are the policies that we need to do in terms of help, financial help, in terms of, uh, of the policies itself, the design of policies for Latin America? And certainly this uh, uh, has been, uh, many people have spoken, many very openly among them. I received, Karen, late last night, a letter from the Club de Madrid of yeah. former presidents of Latin America uh, and Spain uh, who are signing for the postponement, are asking the postponement of the election. It would be a very good idea, you know, uh, uh, to postpone this election. And of course have, you know, uh, Mr. Claver Carona could have, you know, his uh, uh, opportunity, but we should discuss agendas first. This is a time to discuss what needs to be done. Jeff, on this, any take before we close? Exactly. exactly. Have the election in mid-November. We'll see. Okay, well, thanks to both of you. Unfortunately, we ran out of time. Again, uh, Jeff's book. Thank you. Of globalization. Thank you very much for sharing with us. Felipe, thank you very much for <laughs> joining us in this great discussion. Uh, the book available again at Amazon. It's by Columbia Press. Uh, and um, Jeff, we hope to... See you soon in, in person, person whenever you can fly. And but we'll be following you during the next 77 days uh, till we reach uh, November 3rd. And hopefully, this is my personal opinion. I guess I, I side with you on this one. Absolutely. <laughs> we'll see a big change. Election the for the world. Yeah. And for the benefit of the world. Felipe, again, thank you. We will be in touch, uh, maybe for another discussion. Thanks Fantastic. to all of us, uh, all of you that have tuned in. Thank you for Fundación Chilena del Pacifico and Clapes UC. And to all of you, have a great rest of the week. Thanks, Jeff. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you.